Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to Leaping into Literature Reviews on this um, Leap Day here. And um, I'm Joyce Garzinski. I'm the Assistant University Librarian for Communication and Digital Scholarship. I'm also the Mass Communication Liaison. And I'm Carrie Price. I'm the Research Impact and Health Professions Librarian here at the Cook Library. And so uh, today, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about um, two different meanings of uh, literature reviews. First, I'm going to talk about uh, what I've worked with um, in terms of setting up uh, an original study and the role that a literature review plays in that. Um, I'll be talking about the what, the where, and the how um, of that piece. And uh, Carrie is going to be uh, talking more about the systematic review of research and uh, the why, the what, and the how of that process. So I'm going to get started. Um, so what do we mean by literature review? So um, it's a topic that's used quite a bit um, in a variety of contexts, and it can have different meanings. So Today, we're going to look at it uh, in terms of that section of a journal article that talks about what's been done before and sets up an original research study. Um, and we're also going to talk about um, that systematic review of the literature. Um, and Carrie's going to jump in and talk about that. So um, this workshop will cover both of those today. So uh, first, I'm going to get started by talking about that first meaning, that section of uh, a research paper uh, of an original study that talks about what literature has been done before. So it typically comes after the introduction um, in a journal article. So you'll have that uh, introduction that talks about why um, this, this research is important. And then it will jump into talking about what uh, what research has been done in the past. Um, the purpose in this case is to set up an original research study. Um, so it's it's setting that context of uh, original research. Usually, this section ends uh, in, with research questions or a hypothesis um, for that study. And what it does, what the function of a literature review in this case is, is it makes the case for research that's going to be conducted. So it's the idea of considering what's been done in the past, this is why this study needed to be conducted. So the past research serves as evidence um, for the current study. And in terms of where you search, um, to find the past literature for a, a literature review of this kind, um, it really depends on your discipline. Uh, here at Cook Library, we have lots of different databases uh, for a variety of disciplines, which you can see on the screen. Um, and so these are really the best tools to help you get started in your search, um, to find that past literature to help set up an original research study. So how do you search? How do you find that past literature? Well, um, first thing you wanna do is determine your topic and what it is that you're researching. And uh, I highly recommend that you take your topic and kind of pull it apart. So you wanna look for the, the key concepts that are in your topic. So whether they be your variables um, your independent, your dependent variables, what affects what in your study that you're you're doing. Um, also, if there's any theoretical underpinning, that's a, a key concept. And also, you want to think about the context uh, in which your your research exists. Meaning, you know, what's the population? Are you looking at college students? Uh, are you looking at children? Um, so those can all be potential key concepts that you're researching. 
And you also want to think about what are other words for those key concepts? What are synonyms? Um, in some cases, what are the opposite words? So you want to think about related words as well. Um, so this brainstorming is really critical um, to setting up your search. And I have um, on the screen sort of a, a sample search that looks at um, the effectiveness of celebrities um, in advertisements. And you can see I've got um, advertising, advertising or commercial, because that's a synonym, and a celebrity. So um, that's how you want to be thinking about your, your topic and your, your, your key concepts. Now, um, I think what happens is a lot of times when you do this initial search for your topic, um, it's easy to hit some roadblocks. So one of the ones that I frequently see um, is that you do a search like this one here and you come up with too many results. Uh, basically, they don't all hang well together. They're about different things. And so I see a lot of times that people get stuck in this instance. And um, what I recommend in this case is that you really want to think about what aspect of your topic do you want to focus on? Um, this search here is a little bit too broad. Um, we don't have uh, a dependent variable, so we might also want to add in another line to our search, like, um, you know, looking at um, how, uh, you know, celebrities in advertising impact purchase intention, for example. So adding in another key concept, adding in um, another um, level, another and, so to speak, um, will help narrow down the results. So really, if you have a lot of results after you do that initial search for your topic, you want to think about um, how can I narrow this down? What direction do I really want to take this in? Another problem um, that I often hear about is, oh, I searched for my topic and I got too few results. There's, there's nothing on my topic. And in that case, I often say, congratulations, um, you've hit on something that's unique. And so um, what you want to do in that instance is think about what research has been done before that you can then apply to this particular situation. So um, oftentimes I've helped students who are <clears throat> researching um, dating on uh, a different or new dating app, and they struggle to find literature that's related to that dating app. And I say, okay, um, let's think a little bit more broadly. There's a whole lot related to online dating, um, you know, going back in time in the literature. And so taking that step of broadening out your search and thinking about what has been done before that would be applicable to my research um, that I can use. So that'll help you find the, the sweet spot. Then I also recommend after you've searched for your variables um, and your theories together, you want to search um, for them independently. Um, see what you can learn about each of your variables and the theory that you're going to use um, because those are going to be sections in your literature review. So you're going to want to talk about and be able to talk about in your literature review um, what those concepts, what those variables mean to you. So it's important to research those each on their own too so you can get that background. And um, I also want to talk a little bit about um, the importance of researching um, how your variables and your theories have been applied in your context. And I think this is where the context comes in. Um, I'm not a fan of using Google Scholar to do 
subject searches. I think it, it can be clumsy and it can be really hard to find literature that way um, and really do a comprehensive search. Instead, what I recommend that you do <clears throat> is, especially if you're working with theories, find the seminal work for that theory, um, that article or that book that originated a theory, where it first came from, and then search for that work in Google Scholar. And Google Scholar has this great mechanism where you can search within citing articles and search for your context. And I think this is really helpful because, especially when you're using a theory, um, chances are anyone who is using a theory is going to cite that original seminal work. And so um, researching how that seminal work has been applied in your context can be a great way to, this, to research and then in your literature review, discuss why um, you're defining your variables that way. And then ultimately you're going to want to put it all together into a literature review. So you're gonna want to pull out common themes across the research. So as you're doing your searching, <clears throat> as you're finding articles, you're going to essentially be able to put these articles into buckets. There will be common themes across articles. You want to be able to identify them. Then what you're going to do is weave those themes together into a thesis. Um, remember, your thesis comes at the end of your introduction to your paper. And uh, you want to make sure that you hit on all of those common themes that you're going to be discussing in um, your research. Also, um, you can then use the sections in your literature review to make the case um, that those common themes exist. So what I mean by that is your articles are going to serve as your evidence. Essentially, in this case, you want to view a literature review as an argument. It's an argument in the sense that you are setting up an original research study. You are making the case for why this research needs to be conducted. And so you've pulled out these common themes and now you wanna use those articles to make the case for why those common themes exist. Um, one of the ways I think it's really helpful to um, visualize this is uh, as I've done here. So pull out those common themes. You can write them in, um, in circles and in boxes and then write your thesis out, how you're gonna weave those together and then pull them out as you would as sections in your paper. Um, so, and discuss what you're going to talk about in each section and how you're going to make the case um, that these sections exist, or that these trends in the literature, these common themes exist. Um, so you can see here, um, my thesis is over time, the ways that researchers have defined authenticity, that's theme one, and the ways that they have suggested that organizations can convey authenticity on social media have evolved, there's theme two. Um, since the research suggests that social media authenticity can help an organization build trust, theme three, it is important for future research on social media authenticity to examine how organizations can use authenticity to rebuild trust after a crisis. So here in that final theme is where you're making that connection to your own research and, and building that bridge. Um, to where your own research is going. And so now I'm gonna turn it over to Carrie to talk about um, literature reviews in a more systematic way. Thank you, Joyce, and uh, thank you for being here. So I'm gonna tackle some of the kinds of expert literature reviews you might find in the health professions, but also in the social sciences. It really depends, they're being done kind of everywhere now. So 
Let me see if I can actually, can I share my screen? Um, sure. All right. So here we are guidance on literature reviews. So we do have a guide planning for your expert literature review, and I'll drop a link to this in the chat, but I wanted to show you some of the great things you can find here. Here's the link. So there's been a couple of review articles written over the past two decades about the typologies of reviews. So if you're looking to publish and you don't think a narrative review is going to cut it for you, well, you're lucky because you have a lot of options. And I wanted to show you one of the most well-known articles here um, from Grant and Booth. Hopefully I can get access to this. If not, there are a few others. Um, so in 2009, they kind of looked at all the types of reviews that are being written and they synthesized it into a typology of reviews. And let me see if I can find the table. All right. So they talk about, um, They talk about critical review, literature review, a systematic or mapping review, a meta-analysis, mixed methods review, an overview of reviews, sometimes also called an umbrella review, qualitative systematic review, qualitative evidence synthesis, rapid scoping, state of the art, the traditional systematic review, systematic search, systematized review, which we sometimes consider as being taught for um, students in graduate programs where maybe they don't have the full amount of time that they need to do to complete a full systematic review. So a systematized review eliminates some of those steps. An umbrella review, and they go into more detail there. So this is a really great article. I'll drop a link in the chat. And this might help you decide, okay, here's my topic, and maybe the one that's the most suitable for this topic is a scoping review. So that's a great one. Um, I wanted to show you one more, which is this one from Mun et al. And they have also a great table on the different types of literature reviews. Uh, systematic reviews, they say that you can use them for topics of effectiveness interventions for qualitative research, for economic evaluations, prevalence and incidence, diagnostic test accuracy, etiology and risk, expert opinion or policy, psychometrics, prognostic methodology. So you can see these aren't limited to just medicine and the health professions. You really have a lot of options when it comes to choosing what kind of review is right for you. So I would recommend looking at a couple of those articles and maybe just getting an idea because each of these reviews has different methodologies and they're pretty strict these days. Uh, systematic reviews, actually the first one was published in 1753. Uh, James Lind looking at the effects of treatment for scurvy. That was the first systematic review, but since then they've been used in the social sciences, they've been used in medicine and health and they all uh, have different methodologies. Other ways to kind of get an idea of how your review might fit into the bigger picture is I like to look at into a database using some of the tips and tricks that Joyce shared to see if a review has been published on your topic already. So one, if it's been published already, maybe you don't need to do one on that topic. Maybe you can change your topic. Or maybe it can help you out a lot if you're a student and you just want to see, has somebody else done this? then looking at another review on the same topic could be really helpful for how you're going to structure your ideas. So I like to see if one's been published either to help me choose a different topic or to really use that idea to move forward. Then in, uh, in academia, we ask, why do we review the literature? I always say it's to see what's out there. We wanna see what's been done and what needs to be done, where the gaps are to evaluate the evidence. Is this good high quality evidence or is this poor low quality evidence? And um, you know, it depends. You have to use your critical thinking and critical appraisal skills. 
You can take that information and synthesize it, as Joyce mentioned, putting it into different categories or themes. It may help you or others inform decision making about a lot of things, about policy, about patient care, about mm, who knows. And then you're going to contribute to that existing knowledge. So the components of an expert literature review might look something like this. And this is just a very basic outline. Believe me, you can get much more complex, but you're going to have the introduction, the methods which are going to detail how you did the review, the results of that review. What did you find? What did it mean? Discussion and conclusion. And a lot of times they abbreviate this as IMRAD, introduction, methods, results and discussion. But of course you need a conclusion and the conclusion is always further research is needed. So why else are they important? In medicine, these systematic reviews are held at the top of an evidence-based pyramid. A lot of times instructors tell their students, um, if you find a good systematic review, you know, that's good evidence. So Yes, in a way they are because they synthesize the results of other studies and other trials and other people's work and affect, again, decision making may have an effect on outcomes for different population groups, reducing bias in whatever discipline we're talking about. I think of it in terms of health care, health disparities, uh, cost efficiency, quality improvement. So they do remain pretty important in the terms of evidence-based medicine, evidence-based practice. So Joyce showed you some database searching ideas and I wanted to take you out to the Cook Library website, which is here, and just point out that if you are having trouble getting started, you can always go to our A to Z database list. And under subjects here, let's say you're in business, you'll have an idea of some of the databases that you might search in business. Uh, these are, some of them are bibliographic literature databases, and that's typically what you would search in a literature review. You also get a link to your librarian who can further help you refine where you'd like to search. And just because I'm here, uh, in, in health professions, the three big databases are Medline, which is contained within PubMed, so they're kind of synonymous in a way. Medline, uh, Embase, which we have access to, and another one would be called CINAHL, the Cumulative Index to Nursing and Allied Health Literature. So there are plenty of databases to search, and I would recommend searching two to four. Three to five is also okay, but each database is going to have unique results. So what you find in Medline, you may find something extra in Embase. So keep that in mind. That's why it's important to search more than one place. And again, just some, some of the ones that are really good for certain disciplines. Of course, we have the Psych Info from the American Psychological Association. We have one called PTSD Pubs. Education has some great databases. And these are things that librarians can help you with if you're feeling a little bit lost. Now, when you do something like a systematic or a scoping review, it's really important to keep your search documentation. If they live at the top of an evidence-based pyramid, then they should be reproducible. And when we talk about research, even systematic scoping, et cetera, reviews should be reproducible. So I'm a big fan of keeping your search documentation so that you can you know, either submit it to your professor or submit it to a journal when you go to try to publish. And these are some of the things that you'll need to capture. Where did you search? So which databases did you use? What day did you search? That's important because what you search today, you're going to have different results in three weeks. So we need to know the date of the search. Uh, what terms did you use? And there are ways to capture those. What limits or filters did you apply? Did you limit to English? Did you limit to 10 years? I know a lot of nurses and nursing faculty like to limit to five years. Well, that's a pretty short window, but we do need to know if that limit was applied because that may affect the results of the review. How many results did you get? 
And how did you decide what was important? So oftentimes you'll take the results that you got and then go through a screening process based on inclusion and exclusion criteria. Are you accepting this population, this intervention? Um, you know, is it in the United States or in another country? Would you accept the research done in another country? So some of that needs to be documented in your methods. I like to encourage you to use a search document and I do have links um, on the Cook Library website. I have one in Word, this is in Word, and then this is the one in Excel. And I say, however you capture it is fine with me. If you prefer one over the other, that's fine. But basically we need to know date, topic, your concept search terms, and hey, you might have three concepts, you might have four, but normally we're gonna start with two. And then you're just going to capture each of these. Um, so you searched Medline on February 29th. You used such and such terms. You had 450 results. You limited to English and you limited to 10 years. Those are the kinds of things that you need to keep. And then it, in systematic and scoping reviews, there's the idea of risk of bias, assessment and data extraction. I'm not gonna get into that today. That could take a whole semester. And in fact, it does for a lot of, uh, a lot of courses on systematic and scoping reviews. But I just wanna talk about note-taking. So once you've found the articles that you want to keep, include or write about, then there you, you have options for how to write, how to uh, synthesize it. And one of the ones that I like is the Cornell note-taking method. And this isn't from Cornell, but I just wanted to show you how you could maybe start to set that up. So Cornell notes is basically uh, a two column page where you're going to keep the source over here, I believe, and the notes over here. So as you go along reading each article, you could keep your notes and that's going to help you come back and decide what those themes are that are coming out over and over again, and then how you might structure your final paper. Um, and this is with a, a, an app called GoodNotes, which I actually happen to have on my iPad. Um, I think there's like a very minimal cost, but it's been a great note-taking system. So that's one way where you might keep your notes. And you could do this in Word too. Don't feel like you have to handwrite this, especially you could do it in Word. You could do it in Excel. And the other way you might do this is by keeping a literature review matrix. And I actually really liked this guide from Walden University. I say, don't recreate the wheel if you don't need to. So they have some templates here for keeping your notes about the literature that you find. Uh, they have two examples, and then they have a word in an Excel document. So let's look at an example. So here you have a column for author date, and then uh, a column for the theoretical or conceptual framework, research question hypotheses, the methods, analysis and results, conclusions, implications for future research, and implications for practice. So perhaps you take one article, you read it, you read it again, you read it again, until it makes sense to you. And then you'll be able to fill out some of these things and then maybe even see how they compare to each other. So I really like the literature review matrix. Um, I find this helpful for students and for faculty. Another big question about these larger literature reviews or even smaller literature reviews is, oh my gosh, how do I keep track of everything? Well, we have, you know, it's 2024, we have tools. So there are free tools, there are tools that cost a little bit. I'm gonna show you tools that are, mo oh, I have to fix that link, that are mostly free. Um, EndNote is a citation management tool. It has a free version and a paid version. Um, and you can 
try it for free. You can get a trial. It's going to help you keep your references in one place, insert your citations, and uh, do in-text yeah, reference list or reference list when you write your review. The other one is called Zotero. This is an absolutely free tool. I highly recommend. I recommend it so much that I'm going to put a link in the chat. I'm not paid by Zotero. I'm not uh, advertising for them, but students love this. Faculty love this. All you have to do is download the, the tool. So for me, it's, it's telling me you get Zotero for Windows. If you have a Mac, it's going to tell you that. And you can also use the Zotero connector. Depending on what browser you use, you'll be able to say, find an article on PubMed and then say, I'd like to keep this article in my Zotero library. And then you'll be able to um, add it in with just the click of a button. So this is a great free tool for students and for faculty to keep all your references in one place and to do your in-text citations and reference lists. And I just wanna show you what it looks like. And this is in particular helpful for literature reviews. So here I have some literature that I've pulled out. It looks like I have a lot of duplicates, so I could definitely stand to do some cleaning up. Over here on the left, I can organize by project. I have some that are my own, some that I used for a webinar, some about retractions. And over here on the right, you'll see rec the metadata about that article. And usually you'll see a URL, uh, but I'm striking out here today. So you'll be able to get back to that URL. You'll be able to add a PDF. Um, and as you see, it's even telling me that an art article I had gathered has been retracted. So this is great for retractions. I'm pretty sure that in Zotero, you can annotate your PDFs, which is another major feature of this very free tool. I highly recommend. Another tool is called Rayon. This is a free tool. Uh, I'm just gonna send you the first part of the URL. And what this does is if you have decided to really undertake a systematic or scoping review, this is going to help you screen the results. As you may know, a lot of times those reviews have uh, thousands of results, 2,000 results, 3,000 results. You can see some of mine over here, 1,100, 1,600. Well, we have to look at them and decide whether to include or exclude. And so this can help you screen them. You can look at your results. Let me see if I can get into this. So I have imported 1,155 references. There are 907 duplicates, which means that between, say, Medline and CINAHL, there were duplicates. That's okay. Um, I can resolve those duplicates. And I can also start screening. So let's see if that's going to work for me. I just restored this review after I had it archived, so I'm not sure that it's going to work today. But down here, you would see uh, a little pie chart that tells you how many have been included, how many have been excluded, how many are undecided. So this is going to make that whole process a lot easier. Up until a couple of years ago, people were using Excel spreadsheets to do this kind of work, and you don't have to do that anymore. You can use all these amazing free tools. And the other tool suite is called Systematic Review Accelerator, SR Accelerator. I thought I had it up here, but I don't. Let me just pull it up. You don't have to be doing a systematic review in order to use the Systematic Review Accelerator, but they do have some really excellent tools over here. The Methods Wizard will tell you more about the types of review and what's appropriate for your topic. And then the Screenatron tool is going to help you screen through your 100, 200, 300, 5,000 references. You just have to upload them here. And you could do that by exporting from each database. And another favorite feature of this tool is called Spider Site. So let's say you end up with six references that you are definitely including. Then you can drag them in here with a file, and you can get the cited references 
and the citing references. So that's called uh, forward and backward citation searching or citation chaining. And that's important for these types of reviews that you're going both backward and forward with the articles you've decided to include. And I've linked those here except for Zotero, which is pretty easy. It's just Zotero.org. But they are definitely worth investigating and will save you, I hope, hundreds of hours of time. And um, I'd like to say thank you in time for questions, but I'm not quite there yet. Um, if you're doing a systematic or scoping review or any type of literature review that you hope to get published, uh, there are reporting standards. They're called PRISMA, Transparent Reporting of Systematic Reviews and Meta-Analyses. And they have extensions. So they have extensions for abstracts, for protocols, for scoping reviews. The one I'd like to show you today, being in the world of libraries, is the Prisma for Searching. This is a thick 16 item checklist. Let's see. Um, that what that tells you what you should capture in your literature review methods. So I can't make it any bigger, I'm sorry, but we do have to capture that database name. Did we search Medline? And stating the platform for each. So um, you may have heard of EBSCO. Well, EBSCO is a platform for the database called Medline. And so you can always talk to a librarian if you're confused. Other things you might report are if you searched any study registries or maybe preprint archives, um, if you did any online browsing using Google, if you did citation searching, um, any other methods you use to search. And then items eight through 13 detail how you should document your search strategies, search filters, limits and restrictions, any updates. Uh, around 2020, people started peer reviewing, not just the manuscript itself, but before the manuscript even gets there, the search itself. It's called Press Peer Review of Electronic Search Strategies. So if anybody does that, that should be documented and reported. And then the records. Did you find 8,000 records? And how many duplicates were there? And you're going to describe how you handled those records. So this is the Prisma search extension. I refer to it often, and I'll put a link here in the chat. But all of the Prisma tools are worth checking out, even if you're not doing a systematic review. Um, let's see, there's a checklist, and this is for your whole review. How to name your review, how to write the abstract, introduction, methods, results, discussion, and other information. So I love to spread the word of the Prisma reporting standards. Um, but that's a key piece of information that I wanted to share before coming to this slide, which is time for questions for either one of us. And I'll stop sharing for now.